There is only one thing on this earth more powerful than evil, and that's us. Hello, boys and girls. This is Spike. You're listening to Buffy Back Issue Bin. Don't turn it off or I'll rip your throat out. Welcome to the Buffy Back Issue Bin, the show where we go through all the Buffy and Angel comics that are canon chronologically. I'm Zach. And I'm Emily. Uh, sorry, I forgot the intro myself there. Because that was Spike. That was Spike. You forgot that was I forgot this is the first time that we've used the Spike intro. Yeah. Happy Spike Day, everybody. It's a weird day to have. It was... It was a weird moment for you. I was going to say, you were there. <laughs> don't, no, but... Don't claim it for yourself. I heard the play-by-play. I'm probably not going to do the play-by-play. 17 times. Yeah, unrealistic. Potential, though. <laughs> Probable. No, I was at a show last... It doesn't matter when you're listening to this. I was at a show recently working. There were a few Buffy people there, and I took the time to get us a few new podcast intros. Here another one next week. Also exciting. Also fun and different. <laughs> I like next week's too. I like them both. They're both good. They are. They're lovely. But dear listener, I feel like you don't understand how excited he was about these. Like, I don't even think you said hi to me. You just pressed play. <laughs> just subtly. You were just like, listen. Very exciting. But yeah. So met a few new Buffy people. I didn't ask James to do the Spike thing. He, that was just totally on his own volition, which was cool. James Marsters, by the way. Yeah. Not just, we're on a first name basis. Not just James, <laughs> the random person that we know. <laughs> But yeah, that was really cool. Also, in real life, wears cool jackets. Life imitating art. I feel like I also need to corroborate that story that that was also like the second important things that you told me that night when you called me. You were like, and he's wearing a really cool jacket. And I really like it. <laughs> it's true. Like, can we be jacket friends as a man with many cool jackets? You have some cool jackets. You don't have many jackets to begin with. Your jackets are cool. One, two, three, four, five. I have six cool jackets. <laughs> How many uncool jackets do you have? Two. <laughs> <laughs> Is one of them in the back of your car? Three. Is it the same one that my dad has? <laughs> yep. That's an uncool jacket. That is an uncool. It's a warm jacket for emergencies. <laughs> it has been used on more than one occasion. For a man with many jackets, you're not good at bringing one. <laughs> but yeah, that was a thing. So that was fun. Yeah. I wasn't there, though. I had to go to school and then go to the store, like the real store. So I didn't get to go down and meet James and company, but... I was on the road and I left my table. I said, screw it. I'm gonna go meet my buddy James. What we were doing this week, since all of the Buffy and Angel comics are done, at least in this canon, we're going to be doing a few kind of editorial-esque shows, or in this case, a listicle. I do quite enjoy a good listicle. Well, this is going to be the best one ever. Because it's an auditory listicle? I guess. Or because we're doing it. You have written listicles before. I've been paid. I know. But I got bored of doing it. Yes. And then we started this. And I guess Patreon pays us. Yeah. So thank you, all the patrons out there. And if you'd like to become a Patreon, you get all of our shows a week early. And well, you get the other show a day early. Because we're still going. So this week we are counting down the top 15 Buffy and Angel comics moments. Originally it was going to be 10, and then I really liked an 11th one, and then I got to 13, and then we just decided to do 15. <laughs> because 13's a weird number to stop at. Yes. Just as a quick intro, these aren't arcs, they're moments within the story. They could be, some of them are a little bit bigger than others, but for the most part they're they're pretty specific moments. So these are our 15 top moments in the Buffy slash Angel comics. Number 15 from Buffy season 10, number four by Christos Gage and Rebecca Isaacs. Willow is a trope. Yes. Dark Willow, who is incidentally behind us where we podcast. There's like a little free statue that you got of Dark Willow. Hard price to argue with. This is the moment when Willow is lamenting the fact that everybody thinks she's a trope. Yeah. Just uses Dark Willow as like, oh, we might turn into Dark Willow. It's a verb. Becoming Dark Willow is an action. But what's funny about this, why I like the idea of tropes in Buffy, is that Buffy created a lot of TV tropes. The language of Buffy is still used in TV writer rooms today. How a season is planned. The term of the use, big bad. Buffy is a trope creator. And even within the show, they would sometimes fall back on their own tropes a little too much. And I like the idea of making fun of it. Yeah. And also, this is one of those moments that feels like the characters in the TV show have seamlessly transitioned, more or less. Speaking of that... Number 14, from Buffy Season 8, number 28, written by Jane Espenson, with art by George's Genty, Willow, and Patty Cake. <laughs> I stand by it. I brought this moment up a couple of times. The Willow said to Buffy when playing with Oz's baby, Hey, Buffy, you want to play with a baby? He's working up some fine Patty Cake skills. Don't let him hustle you. And that just feels so 
show like. It is so very appropriate then that it is written by one of the actual show writers, Jane Espenson. This is one of those lines where you can hear exactly what the actress would have performed as far as inflection and all of that. You could just hear every bit of it and it sounds so perfect. And for whatever reason, this line has always stood out. Do you want to know why I think it has always stood out? No. No, you don't want to know? Oh, I don't know why. Why? Oh, because Allison Hannigan has always been one of your favorites. I feel like you can hear the cadence. Oh, no, I can hear it too. But I feel like that helps too. What number is this? Number 13. (laughs) (laughs) We already got lost in the list. Go two in. (laughs) Number 13 from Angel and Faith season nine, number 11 by Christos Gage and Rebecca Isaacs. Connor jumping on Angel's car. So Connor is not my favorite. What? What? No one knew that. I know. I hit it so well. This one is kind of fun because... Angel wants to run away. And Connor literally jumps on the hood of his car to be like, what you doing? Hops out of panel. So everyone saw this man jump 15 feet in the air. Yes. It lands on the car. But I like the reverse of the relationship of Connor wanting to be the one to engage with Angel and Angel being afraid to go near Connor when he spent all that time trying to get him back. And this is the moment that Connor calls him up for wearing a hoodie. Yeah. Yeah. What I also think is really funny about this, which I didn't really think about when we were doing the show itself, is that Angel has had Gun kind of keeping tabs on Connor, and Connor recognizes the car immediately and jumps on it, meaning that Gun isn't very good at this. No, no. No, no, no. He just sees it from afar. He's like, ooh, that's the stocking car. <laughs> oh, ooh, it has my dad. Ha, he's wearing a hoodie. <laughs> okay. I should call him out for that. The reason that it made me laugh about this is that I feel like if your dad wore a hoodie, you would have the same exact reaction, jump on a car and call him out for it. You're not the car jumping. Why not? Respect the hood. Oh, would you hurt a hood if you jumped on it? Yes. Would I hurt a hood if I jumped on it? Maybe if you jumped 15 feet in the air. I can't jump 15 feet in the air. Number 12, from Angel After the Fall, number seven by Brian Lynch and Nick Rung, when Wesley threatens the senior partners. So Wes is another one of your favorites. He also watches over us as we do this podcasting. (laughs) You guys should see just the lineup that we have. To be fair, they all kind of fell into your lap. Like, I don't think you actually went out of your way to procure any of the the fun little people behind us. But Wes is there as well. So Wes died in the Angel series finale, if you didn't know. I remember. But I love that Wolfram and Hart brings him back under contract, which is such a gut punch. But Wes's reaction isn't, how do I get to Angel? How do I help? How do I get to be alive again? How do I get to Fred? His reaction is the big picture guy, the guy who just goes, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. He doesn't know how he's going to get there, but he knows that's what he's going to do. And that's just a moment that's so true to the character and just the guy who isn't being fed the lie that he's given. Right. And I mean, Wes is also the guy that he understood that everything that Wolfram and Hart was trying to project for him was a total, total fantasy. And he was like, I don't want the fantasy. And he doesn't beg to live nothing. I mean, Wolfram and Hart goes out of their way to emasculate him as much as humanly possible, giving him back his old look, making it so he can't even ironically, affect the, the world o- around him, can't touch anything. Ironically, the old look is the one that looks down upon us. So I feel like it's super appropriate. <laughs> But, I mean, even even more than that, he doesn't even beg t- to figure out what's going on or, or what's his contract or how can they bring him back or what under what terms can he be released from it. It's just... All right, I'm going to kill you. Yeah, here I am. I'm not going to worry about how I got here. And I'm going to win. Number 11 from season 10, number 15 by Christos Gage or Rebecca Isaacs. Hello, wanker. Okay, so <laughs> this one makes me smile because... I remember when you bought this issue for real and I hadn't started reading the comics yet, but we were dating and we went down, we went like an hour out of our way to get this comic and you were just so giddy. You were so giddy the crossover that they were movie. talking again. So, <laughs> and I just, you joy, there was, I think you read it in the car and then came back home and read it again. And you even showed me the panel. I remember this funny. and you were like, you don't, I don't even think we'd watch the show yet, but you were just know. like, you don't know these characters yet, but look, they're talking again. <laughs> so for those who haven't picked up on the moment, when Archaeus goes to the Buffy book, Spike has to call Angel for help to get him to come over from England and Giles approaches him to say that he should approach this moment with maturity and dignity. He goes, right. And then he calls up Angel. The first words out of his mouth are, hello, wanker. That should have been what you asked James to record. <laughs> I just asked for an intro and then he took off and did his own thing and I like it. <laughs> Let the man have freedom. Can you also say under recording? <laughs> hello, wanker. Just, just for me. I bet that one that I can probably find. Probably, yeah. Not a big moment, but a good comedic moment. But a very big moment, and not all of you will agree with this. 
Number 10 from season eight, number 39 by Joss Whedon, Scott Alley, and art by George's Genty, The Death of Giles. So this was heartbreaking for me and for (laughs) everybody. uh, You're not a fan of this moment. I don't like it when anybody dies because I don't think that anybody needs to die. I mean, now that Giles is back totally, entirely, whole and his normal age again, I'm less opposed to it. Now it's more like the Gandalf thing when I always knew that Gandalf was going to come back, so it didn't really bother me. This is a huge moment for the whole series. It sets up many more plot lines. It gives everybody higher stakes. And that's the key word for me. Giles' death, it's not about making Angel's redemption that much harder or even Giles dying, although that's the big thing. But what it does is ups the stakes for the entire series because I had definitely been lulled into a sense of at least the main ones are fine. Which is ironic because Wes was pretty main by the end of the whole thing and but, I mean, and he was a casualty. It's also been said that if the sh- show was going to go on that he wouldn't have died. That was just finale. Right. I think that the Giles moment is especially important because Giles hadn't found his place really since they left high school. He, yeah, he since kind the Watchers of was. Fired him. Yeah, he kind of was in the magic box and then he left to go back to England for a while and then he was in the comics. He was training people for a while and he just he hadn't really settled into a spot. And so this felt. His death cleaned that up. It did, but it also kind of broke the remaining kind of dependence that Buffy had on him, clearly, because if he's not there, then. Yeah. Every no fight bueno. after that, anyone could have died. And then it turns out he came back and no one really died ever again. So it's fine. Yay. <laughs> number nine from Frey number eight by Joss Whedon and Carl Moline. Frey being betrayed by Urkon. When the Frey story was given, there's a big feeling of, ah, she's kind of like Buffy in the future. And oh, her watcher, kind of like Giles, but he's just a grumpy demon. But then he kills a small child to motivate Frey, which is no way like Giles. It really lets you know the difference between this world and these characters. Frey's also interesting because it came out while the show was still going on. And I don't like that moment, clearly. But I... The child, yeah. So then she stabs him through the head. That is good. (laughs) I don't know, but yeah, I like that we're not just going down the same parallel road. And it also makes Frey interesting to reread. It kind of paints everything he does in a very different light. Yeah, but also I think I kind of like it because you can see the evolution from Giles to Wes to on a very extreme version, Minotaur Man. (laughs) I don't ever remember his name. It's fine. I know what he looks like. He's fine. He doesn't have a nose. And now he has a big hole in his brain. Yeah. From the stabbing. Solid. But I like that you can see how eventually the watchers, in quotes, got there, given the attitude that we just mentioned about Wes. Number eight from season eight and season 12 by Joss Whedon, Christos Gage, and George's Genty, the thing about changing the world. Oh my gosh, you're such a sap. You were so into this. It's a bit of a cheat, but I like that moment kind of stringing itself throughout the books and also really bookending it but it's a good sentiment considering the way that the tv show ended up buffy changing the world in a big way and not knowing what that meant for her and opening up that door and kind of following that path and that journey and also her redefining what it means for her based on what we saw in the comics not only is it cyclical but it creates an arc i like that each time it changes appropriately to what buffy's understanding of the world is at the time so at first it's the world doesn't change and then at the end it's that it's all totally worth it number seven from season 10 number 18 by christos gage rebecca isaacs buffy angel and spike all together again oh my gosh is there anything that you love more than all of them together all of them together in a line what made this so exciting is even though they did see a little bit of each other in season eight they weren't really together together and angel's busy being possessed They spent so much of both shows talking about the other one. They always pair up two of them. They talk about the other one and it went on and on in so many different directions. They hadn't really been together since season three, number eight. To be exact. If you want. But yeah, I mean, you think about this iconic triangle has really only been two pairs at a time. It's been close. It's been so close a bunch of times, but never quite. And they are so iconic this is like the tv love triangle that still is brought up today yeah you gotta pick one or the other never riley poor riley i pick riley but getting the three of them together in one room and fighting together it's great and then they do it again in season 12 but boy it was more exciting the first time around it was more just the three of them season 12 was like more desperate more everything falling apart angel making speeches angel always makes speeches not new not a character moment as you guys will notice on this list (laughs) I did like that last one, though. 
Number 16, Angel's Speech. <laughs> Season 12. Number 6, from After the Fall, number 17, by Brian Lynch and Franco Uru, Illyria protecting Gun in the Hospital. With a giant spear? Oh yeah, with a giant spear. Is that spear. a spear? Is she, that what we call that? She's stabbing demons through the head. She's got a big it, old bandolier. In the hospital room. Do you guys right right outside of it. Yeah, because Gunn is recovering from being, being stabbed human a bunch. again. Yes. <laughs> Massive blood from loss. From everything going back and losing an eye. And the only thing that Illyria can do is protect Charles Gunn because he was important to Fred. Yes. And, and because it's awesome. And because she couldn't protect Wes, who was also important to Fred. Sad. And that breaks my heart. I love that moment. That's so badass. Yes. I love a good decapitation. What can I say? <laughs> So many of these are the soap opera moments. Also, please note that I did not, I contributed to this list, but I did not put the bones of this list together. So when they're all the love triangle soap opera moments, those were not my ones that I put on there. Should I put in more decapitations? No, no. Just wanted everybody to know who the hopeless sappy romantic is number five from angel and faith season nine number 21 by chris doskage and rebecca isaacs spike leaves for dawn <laughs> going back to the sappy soap opera moments but yes i love it dawn is fading from everyone's memory angel and faith have already forgotten her but spike through his connection with her remembers and angel and faith literally have to go save the world and unlike when he had to give up fred to save the world he does the opposite this time he goes to save the girl instead of the world and it's not a romance thing it's not a weird sex thing it's just spike has a connection with dawn and i like that a lot it's like a big brother little sister thing and there's nothing that spike wouldn't do in this world clearly to save dawn and not to harp on all the things that you told me but you foreshadowed a lot of this stuff before i actually read it so when we got to the moment in the show when spike and dawn are riding on that motorcycle together oh yeah you brought this up and you were like, there's going to be a point. Like, I love watching this relationship blossom because there's a point where Spike gives up everything to save Don. And that's and the I was way like, he got that bike. <laughs> Just clotheslining that demon off of it. It's like, and I have a motorcycle now. But yeah, it, it's so incredibly sweet because that's Spike's true character. It's not that he always has to be the best and always has to, you know, he doesn't always have that hero complex, but he's going to go save his friend and i like the connection that he has with don it's very similar to the one that he has with fred that i like as well sweet number four from season 11 number 12 by christos gage or rebecca isaacs buffy finally saying i love you to spike Aww, so and, sweet i said it then and i could i'll say it again not i mean i really like the way buffy ended but if you had to end everything right then and there if they didn't know they were going to get a season 12 totally could have worked yeah and we even talked about this with season 12 that buffy and spike broke up but it's not i don't know i like them better together and yeah, i see why they broke point. up and i see all of those things but i loved that moment when buffy and especially said that because i, I mean you. she said it at the season seven finale but but that was like desperation. You're saving the world for me. Yeah, it's probably a thing I should say. I love say. you. Bye. And there was Thanks always that dying. question of did Buffy really mean it or did she not or did she mean it at the moment? But I mean, this is at this point an established relationship, something where they've gone through some real stuff together and not just ended the world like we're blowing up kind of thing. They also went through that a bunch too, but you know, par for the course. Yeah, but at this point it's tried and true. It feels real and it doesn't feel like the weird like high school romancy stuff with Angel where it's all like heightened emotions and cookies. Everyone's over the top, yeah cookie metaphors number three from after the fall number six by brian lynch and john byrne this one's mine <laughs> yeah. this isn't even a moment it's only a few pages but whatever we're it just, is a we're, moment we're, we're gonna roll with it because there isn't really it's a poem it is all of lauren's stuff from first night it's so different and it's so just perfect i love it because lauren doesn't transfer well to the page he is a musical demon who needs audio to really function the right way it only makes sense that if you're going to put them on the page you do it in rhyme and you do it in a poem and and it's this beautifully illustrated thanks john Byrne. yeah and john um, Byrne really switched up his style for this he made it something different and unique that really fit the story and we know from talking with chris rael that he also punched up the dialogue a bit too to make it work more in that kind of sing-songy poetic way. And I just love it because Lauren is such a unique character on the show. The, on both shows, there's no character like Lauren where he's just kind of in his own little world almost. He gets so much darker in Angel, but you can tell that that's not his nature. He doesn't want to live in the darkness. 
And this very much explains how he gets away from his darkest moment of killing Lindsay. Yeah. In cold blood. Yes. It's charming and wonderful and and just this cool little blip. And the one and only time Lindsay makes any kind of appearance. He's mentioned once, but his dead body is the only time he ever shows up in these books. Well, yeah, I mean, Lindsay. Good for Lindsay. Number two. (laughs) Not the point of that moment. (laughs) (laughs) It is amazing, though. Number two. This one's a big cheat. (laughs) Because it's a bunch of moments, but if it was just this, it would have filled up most of this list. Also, I think it's funny that you cheated on the o- on the list that you made up yourself with the rules that you made up yourself as well. And you were like, I like these rules, but I'm going to cheat. Yeah, it's my cheat day. It's my cheat number. Wow. The character reveals. These are all biggies. I'm going to put the biggest emphasis on Willow, Cordelia, and Spike for their reintroductions. And they're all so fun. And they're also different. I mean, when Willow comes in at the end of issue two and she does the whole Giles line of, I'd like to test that theory going up against Amy, she gets that big full play splash. I couldn't have been more excited to read the next issue to see how they're going to throw down. And also teasing it out a little bit, not just giving everyone issue one and getting her coming in like that. Awesome. Cordelia looked perfect and sounded perfect perfect and it, makes you cry it is heartbreaking it's so good and she also gets a big full page reveal i also like how cordelia is used very sparingly yeah just that once idw used her a second time but we don't count that as canon and then there's some weird revisionist stuff that makes it not work in a big way that i'm never going to get into but i like in what the canon is now i like that cordelia doesn't just pop back every seven seconds like oh i'm, I'm still here guys i came right back because that would ruin the importance and the effect and everything that she was there for. And that sells that moment so much of like angels dying. Yeah. And that's why she's there to help him, to ease him through it. And to, yeah. The attention paid to the facial expressions of that one is insane. They're very clearly references from the show. It's so, it looks perfect. And the Spike one is so great when he comes back. And we just talked about this in our last episode. Uh, Not his angel reveal, which is also fine, but I was really more talking about the Buffy one when he comes in and Willow has that whole thing of like, oh, this is going to be good. And just crashing through the ceiling in a spaceship, walking in, all you see is the boots and all he has is just insane swagger. Again, full page reveal. Yes. And yeah, we talked about this in the uh, interview too, didn't we? Yeah. With the, the Mad with his Max clothing moment. choices and his nail polish. and It looks iconic and it looks epic and I love it. And everyone else got really good ones too. I mean, I love turning the page and seeing Wes come back. I love seeing Buffy jumping out of a helicopter. It is really fun. Yeah, getting everyone back. I, I love the initial reveals. Those were just the things that when this book was coming back that just hyped me up in a big way. I would think it was funny though, as I was reading through a couple of these, you were like, you have to imagine now that there was an ad right here. So when you turned this page... <laughs> So that I would know that if it wasn't... The impact. Yes. That it wasn't just like, oh, hey, I can see them on the next page. Yeah. And the number one moment from all of Buffy and Angel comics, from After the Fall number 16 by Brian Lynch and Franco Uru, Angel versus Gun. Also, there was 0.0 chance that this was not going to be an After the Fall for a final moment. It was kind of a toss-up between like this and Connor's death, because Connor's death is such a gut punch. That whole issue is just so tight. But the fight with Gunn is just so much more epic and it's huge and it's massive. And it's this culmination of everything and that's where everything comes crashing together. Illyri is down. Spike and three slayers are fighting off of an army. Connor's dead. Wes can't do anything but talk. And Angel is facing down one of his oldest allies who should be able to beat him. The power has been reversed and Angel has to die in this moment to save everyone. And he does a big Angel speech. <laughs> like, it's still one of my favorite moments of going, rise up, Charles. And then he stabs him to the ground. I'm like, that really wasn't, hey. you, you told him one thing and then you did another. <laughs> he has to go up if he's rising, unless you're raising him. Good point. Maybe it was a typo. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. Oh man, but that is, it is the culmination of everything and nothing ever touched how epic that moment got. I mean, there are moments in season 12 when everyone's fighting or season eight at the end of that big battle, but man, nothing touched this as far as scale and pace and the sense of urgency and beautiful art and beautiful colors and, well, and nothing also, stopped that. Back in After the Fall, you didn't have any sense of what the rules were. It wasn't like... Because all of a sudden we were in a whole different world. We were literally in a hell dimension. So it's not and like... that line of like everyone's come back wrong. I mean, now we know that they Angel got them out of it and they got kind of a reset. In that one line very early on, two seconds after Angel figures it out, Angel dies. Yeah. And that's what happened. And he's decapitated. And it's no good. It saves everyone. Well, yes. But I mean, 
decapitations are generally no good. Yeah, but man, it doesn't top that. That is insane. And it's so crazy to think that After the Fall only went 17 issues. Not including the Spike After the Fall stuff, which is what, another three or four? Four. But compared to like Buffy, which was 40-something, Angel was half of that. Less than. I'm throwing the Spike ones in there too. Oh, okay. (laughs) To at least give it a 21 versus 43. And man, the pace of that fight and the way that that, it's insane. It's absolutely insane how good that moment is. Yeah. Yeah. And because everybody's come back wrong, you have no sense of who's going to survive or if anybody's going to survive. And And Wes went down a second time. And after Angel's decapitated, Wes doesn't beg. He doesn't worry. He just tells Spike to go watch out for Illyria. Because again, he's big picture. Damn, that's a good moment. I feel like you're going to go read this again right after this. It's so good. It's so good. I love it so much. So those are kind of our top 15. I'm sure that you guys have other ones that you would have put in there instead of some of these guys. I bet the Giles one doesn't make it on a lot of your lists. But I mean, top 15 important moments, it definitely makes it on an important moments list. Whether or not it's a favorite moment, it's not my favorite moment, but it's an important moment. So I guess it depends on what you're calling our list. It just changed the game in a big way. Yeah, so important, huge, yes. Memorable, definitely. Because he had the regular face. Fun? No, not so fun. No, I don't think anyone was like, hooray! (laughs) Ooh, (laughs) Oh boy, a beloved character had his neck snapped. What's next? Just like his girlfriend. (laughs) Anyway, write us emails and Twitter things. What are they called? Tweets? I don't know. I don't go on Twitter. I guess, yeah, tweets? Tweet us. At us. Tweet at us. Is that what you say? Just say at at me or don't at me if you're being sassy. Oh, well, I'm not being sassy. So tell us what you guys think because we want to hear from you. So what we have coming up now that we are done with the coverage, uh, we do have one more listicle-esque thing, but then we're going to be doing some editorial shows, hopefully a couple of interviews, and there's still the thing that I haven't really explained yet, our massive kind of cap on all of this, which I don't know how long that episode will be. <laughs> God, that's going to be a beast of a project. That should be a weekend episode for us. <laughs> we recorded over two nights. We're going to have to be hydrated. Oh, goodness. Uh, But there is still some good stuff coming up. The question keeps on getting brought up. Are we going to cover the new material? And I think I have an answer for that. Do you? Yeah. (laughs) I think realistically the first arc will happen. But I think this is going to be if we do it or not. If it's good. Like we're going to read the first arc and then decide? We'll probably do that on Patreon. And then... Okay. But I think the deciding factor is going to be if it's good. We're definitely going to do the Firefly stuff. I've read issue one of that. It's great. So I have all interest in doing that one. But as far as the Buffy stuff goes, it's a whole new canon. It's a whole new world. Are we going to cover it? The answer is, yeah, if it's good. Sounds good. (laughs) If it's bad, I don't want to just rag on a thing. Well, that sounds swell. It's true, though. I don't want to just yell at something. No, that's no fun. Yeah. I want to raise something up, not tear it down. Like gun. (laughs) Rise up. (laughs) Oh, God. Wrong direction. (laughs) like you stabbed me in the gut you literally pushed me down with a pointy thing it's on fire too this is a flaming sword and i am a vampire the problem uh fine i'll cut your head off anyway so that's kind of our thought yeah if you want to find anything it's at the website editorsnotecomics.com we mentioned patreon up top if you give to the patreon you get the show a week early we are on a bi-weekly schedule now versus weekly just because you know things are we're caught up and now we're doing a different thing yeah but we will be back next time unless it's an interview and i don't think it will be for the next one ranking every single buffy comic story in canon from worst to best sounds good see you then bye